The helmeted honey eater, distinctive for its helmet of long erected crown feathers, is a bird endemic to Victoria, Australia. It is one of four subspecies of yellow tufted honey eater and has been classified as critically endangered. By 1989, its sole remaining wild population shrank to 15 individuals, restricted to an area of less than five kilometers squared in Yellingbo Nature Conservation Area. The population has been subject to diverse conservation efforts, including removal of competitor and predatory species, nest protection, supplementary feeding, a captive breeding program that supplements the wild population, and DNA sampling. How have these genetic samples been used for their conservation? We'll talk about four interrelated ways in which genetic data have informed management action. First, since 1999, questions arose about whether the helmeted honey eater was its own subspecies worthy of conservation or just the morphological end of a climb along coastal populations of yellow tufted honey eater. So research at Monash University used morphological and genetic data to answer this question. Morphological data such as helmet size, bill, head, and tarsus length, among others, were used to estimate how different the helmeted honey eater was from its closest relative, Diplanticus. Genetic data, including nuclear and mitochondrial DNA, were used to estimate how divergent the helmeted honey eater was from the other subspecies. The results showed that not only the helmet of the helmeted honey eater is significantly larger than that of, of Gippslandicus, they also showed high levels of genetic differentiation of the helmeted honey eater and Gippslandicus, and that it diverged from it around 56,000 years ago. Overall, these results supported the helmeted honey eater as a conservation unit of its own. The next step was to measure quantitatively how the helmeted honey eater was doing. Nuclear genetic markers from samples collected over two decades were used to diagnose the genetic health of the population. Estimating first, how much had the effective population size and genetic diversity declined? Second, whether inbreeding had increased? And third, whether natural gene flow between Gipplanticus and the helmeted honey eater had declined. They found that first, the number of effective breeders declined by half, dropping from 88 effective breeders in 1990 to 42.1 in 2013, and that genetic diversity declined between 10 and 16%. This is important because the minimum effective population size to avoid inbreeding depression on a short time scale is 100 individuals. Second, it was found that relatedness levels significantly increased from 2004 to 2013. And third, gene flow declined from 4.06 migrants per generation in 1990 to 1.03 two decades later. These results indicated that the helmeted honey eater needed further genetic management to reduce their extinction risk. Therefore, this genetic data was also used to answer whether introducing gene flow from Gipslandicus would be beneficial. Simulations show that combined supplementation with captive bred helmeted honey eaters and Gipslandicus individuals would produce the greatest population growth and heterozygosity increase. So three recommendations were issued. First, to introduce gene flow from Gipslandicus. This is to perform genetic rescue. And this could be started in the captive breeding program where outcomes could be closely monitored before introducing any hybrids to the white population. Second, to introduce around four migrants per generation to restore gene flow to past natural levels. And third, to continue with the supplementation of captive bred helmeted honey eaters. A third way in which genetics informed conservation 
was by measuring in breathing the pressure. Intensive monitoring of the hammered honey eater white population since 1986 allowed the collection of lifetime fitness data and genetic samples of 102 individuals. This kind of lifetime data for long-lived wild vertebrates is very rare, and combining it with genetic data gave a unique opportunity to look at the consequences of being inbred and engaging in inbreeding. A negative relationship was found between how inbred a helmeted honey eater is and how many fledgling it produces over its lifetime. This confirmed high levels of inbreeding depression, with the most inbred individual producing 87 to 90% fewer fledglings than the least inbred individual. It was also found that engaging in inbreeding, this is mating with genetically similar partners, leads to fewer fledglings produced during the lifetime of a helmeted honey eater. And that this gets even worse when the individual engaging in inbreeding is itself very inbred. Finally, inbred individuals had shorter lifespans than less inbred ones. This effect was stronger on females than males, with the most inbred female living half as long as the least inbred female. These results added support to the need of introducing genetic diversity to the helmeted honey eater population through genetic rescue. The Helmeted Honey Eater Recovery Team started genetic rescue trials in 2017. Crosses of Helmeted Honey Eaters and Gippslandicus individuals were done as part of the captive breeding program. Given the strong negative effect of inbreeding on the fitness of Helmeted Honey Eaters, we wondered whether there was inbreeding avoidance in the white population, and if not, whether we could nudge them towards making better pairs. We used field data of seven breeding seasons and 33,000 SNPs to measure how many highly related pairs were formed in each season. We then compared it to how many highly related pairs would be formed in a simulated scenario in which pairing occurred completely at random. This is if there was no inbreeding avoidance in the population. The results were surprising. There were as many highly related pairs being formed by the helmeted honey eaters during seven breeding seasons as there were in the random mating scenario that we simulated. This told us that the white population does not exhibit significant inbreeding avoidance. So we designed two possible in situ breeding management strategies that we could actually implement in the population. Because making two specific helmets and honey eaters made in the wild practically impossible, the strategies focused on discouraging highly related pairs. The first strategy consisted of separating the worst pairs in the population by completely removing one of the partners, which would allow the remaining partner to form a better pair. In the second strategy, the removed partner are translocated to other parts of the population in which they are most likely to form a better pair. Simulating these scenarios produced these results. Neither breeding management strategy is likely to succeed in producing fewer highly related pairs. These results showed that trying to manage the little genetic variation left in the population would not work, and that new genetic variation is needed. Once again, this added support to the genetic rescue trial that by 2020 had produced healthy fertile hybrids in captivity. Pilot introductions of some of these genetic rescue individuals to the white population were done in 2019 and 2020. So how are things going? After five breeding seasons of captive genetic rescue trials, a total of 60 unique admit processes have been done. The success of this admitted process was compared to that of pure helmeted honey eater pairs. We found that overall, admixed pairs had not only larger clutches, but they also produced more independent chick pair nests. 
all this success produced so many captive bred chicks that one thing was clear, genetic rescue of the wild population should start. So since 2019, admixed individuals have been released to the wild population. And even more exciting, 68 birds have been released to a completely new location in the hope of establishing a brand new population. Thank you to all those parties who have contributed to and continue to contribute to CSI.